Good morning, y'all. Good, morning. Good to see you guys this morning. I'm glad we've got some people on, on this side. Where's Ernie? Is Ernie still here this morning? There's Ernie. At first service, poor Ernie was the only person sitting on this whole side of the auditorium. So I'm so glad that we spread out and got it up, filled all in. Everybody doing all right this morning? Listen, I know it's a holiday weekend and we're kind of, you know, we're everybody's just, you know, kind of been doing their own thing. So we're going to start it off this morning with a new song. We're going to sing you guys a song and then we're going to get you all into worship with us. So let's go ahead and get this started. Down it. 
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. If you're not standing already, let's stand and sing. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of his might, oh, sing of his grace. is his path on the wings of the storm. You alone are the matchless king. To you alone be all majesty. Your glories and wonders what tongue can recite. You breathe in the Let's go ahead and be seated. <coughs> good morning. Good morning. So good to see you all. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for the prayers for my dad last week. That was uh, that's meant a lot to me to know you were praying for him. Uh, he went back home and he's doing much better. I think just glad to be home with the dogs, I think. I don't know if my mom's so glad <laughs> just uh, taking care of the dogs by themselves. But any, I'll, I'll can decide. I really do appreciate the prayers. He's, uh, he's doing much better. And uh, we do have uh, uh, lots of things to pray for, lots of, you know, COVID spiking again, uh, you know, things going on in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, you know, folks in Louisiana still recovering from uh, the storm uh, that passed through there. Uh, Kathy Frankie, last uh, Sunday, her daughter-in-law passed. Uh, COVID. Uh, please, please keep the, the Frankie family in your prayers, particularly her, her, uh, her uh, son James. Uh, Justin is in, uh, he's back home today too. They're, they're having a funeral at home. Uh, he lost a cousin to COVID. Uh, Dennis Witt, our own Dennis Witt, he's been uh, struggling with COVID also, been in the hospital and uh, was on 100% oxygen, fluid on the lungs, and we prayed for him in the first service. And uh, David, you mentioned a while ago that uh, the fluid is gone from the lungs now, and he's on, it's 85% uh, oxygen. So he's improvement, but he's, uh, uh, that's quite a lot of improvement, but he still needs the prayer, 
And so please keep uh, Dennis in your prayers and also his wife, Michelle, and their son, Joshua. Uh, this time, I'd like to uh, uh, share some time in the scripture with you. Our reading this morning is Psalm 36, verses 5 to 9. It says this, it says, Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgment's like a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. And the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. For you, with you is the fountain of life. Then you, in your light, we see light. Would you back? <clears throat> Father, it is good to be in your house. It's good to be with brothers and sisters, others who love you. We pray that you would receive this time as a sacrifice of praise and worship. May you find our offering suitable. May it bless you. May Christ be exalted in our hearts, in our minds, and in all areas of our life. Not just as we engage here together today, but also when we part from this place. Lord, may all of our life be rendered to you as an act of worship. Lord, as we come into your presence, we want to bring forth these who's, who have such needs. As they come to mind, Lord, we lift them up to you. Folks struggling with COVID, we, Lord, we pray that you would bring healing to their body. Many people dealing with the loss of loved ones and friends. Pray that you would comfort them in their grief. Many people lost everything in a storm last week. Lost it all. Things going on in Afghanistan impacting the entire world. The uncertainty of things, Lord, it's, it's a frightening time to live. But Lord, we know that with you is the fountain of life. And Lord, we know that you give to us to drink of the river of your delights. And so, Lord, in the midst of all this chaos, Pray that you give us your peace. Pray that you give us your peace. We thank you, Lord, for the many ways that you show your faithfulness to us. These little things that you just kind of drop into life, they seem coincidental or incidental. Pray that you'd help us to see them for the blessing that you intend for them to be. Reminders to us of your care for us. Your attention to our concerns. Reminders of your very near presence to us. And the reality that you are helping. Again, Lord, our prayer this morning is that you'll be honored and glorified in our praises. Amen. I'll read you a verse of scripture this morning. I apologize to you guys. I can, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. I can play the guitar and sing at the same time, but I cannot play and talk at the same time. Um, so um, I'm working on that. Maybe one of these days I'll get it. So uh, I just want to read this scripture. I'd love to be able to play while I'm telling it to you, but let me just read this to you. It says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man 
who takes refuge in him. I'm going to go through these prayer requests this morning and, and, and just praying with people and uh, this past week and, and so many things are going on in people's lives and there's so many so many people that we know that are being uh, afflicted with this disease and, and people people dying and people just getting sick and lives just being destroyed from that from uh, from so many other things that are going on in the world and it's so it would be so easy for us to lose hope and so easy for us to get discouraged but um, I know that the God that I serve is in control and and it's and it's so good to know that the God that I serve I, I can promise you folks there's never been one time that God said well I didn't see that coming because he knows everything that's going to happen he knows he knows everything and I know that the king the, the one who is the king of my heart is the king of the world and he is in control even though it may not feel like he's in control he is in control so I want to get you guys to stand up with me this morning and let's honor him and let's praise him let's remember that he is the king not only of our hearts but he is the king of this world and he sees and he knows and he cares for us sing this with me let the king of my heart be the mountain where i run the fountain i drink from oh he is my song let the king be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my son. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good. that again. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. 
to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt you are the king of kings you are the lord of lords and we glorify you today lord we lift you up and we praise you for that things may seem very chaotic in our in some of our lives right now god but you are in control and help us to remember that lord let us be mindful of that that there is nothing nothing that you don't know about and there's nothing that's out of your control god we love you thank you lord thank you for the promise that we're going to get to hear about uh, that Mel's going to tell us about, Lord. And we just thank you, God, for who you are. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amy, thank you again for blessing us. I got to hear that in the first service too, so doubly blessed. Thank you so much. And uh, Hudson, I want to thank you for uh, filling in for me last week on such short notice. Really appreciate you doing that. And uh, such a blessing to have such gifted folks around. I mean, God is uh, just uh, so wonderfully gifted, uh, our congregation, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. Well, this morning, um, I want to invite you to open up uh, your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 22. Coming in the last chapter of the book, finally. It's been a long time coming. Here we are, Revelation chapter 2, 22 rather, uh, verses 1 to 5 this morning. Uh, the final passage about the eternal state. Uh, John's final description of the new Jerusalem and what awaits those who've placed their hope in Jesus Christ. And uh, as we have unfolded his description of these things, beginning back in chapter 1, uh, I think that we could all agree that as fantastic as it is, maybe it's the fantasticness of it, perhaps. The, the, it, well, this, this all seems far off. It seems distant. It seems un, uh, un, unattainable. It seems like, like a pipe dream almost uh, as we try to make our way through chapter 21, imagining what heaven will be like, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, what this eternal state's going to be like. And I think the difficulty of that is, is well, it's perfect and, and it's pure and it's righteous. There's no sin there. There's no corruption. And we don't have a basis to operate from in order to understand it because we have never experienced life like that before. We've never experienced life without sin or brokenness. We've never experienced life in a world without corruption. And so whenever we read something about, well, we read things like we've seen in chapter 21 and what we're going to look at in chapter 22, it seems like it's just very, very far away, very distant. Can't quite put our hands on it. And, uh, Really, the way the things are happening in the world today, it, it just, I tell you, it seems to indicate that Christ is near, but boy, I tell you, this, this description of heaven, sometimes it just feels like it's just so, so far away from us. Um, as we wrap up the section uh, uh, here in, uh, on this new Jerusalem, chapter 22, verses 1 to 5, uh, I think we're going to find, however, that, that heaven, heaven is much closer than we realize, um, We can get tastes of it here and now. Uh, we can lay hold of it in some ways here and now. And uh, we'll talk about that as we go through our passages this morning. Uh, Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. This is what John says. He says, Then he showed me a river. The angel, that is, who's been giving him the grand tour. Then he showed me a river over the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the, the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. All right, so in these verses, as John concludes his description of the New Jerusalem, he says he saw a river of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Uh, the water is clear as crystal. That's uh, talking about the purity of it, the cleanliness of it. Uh, it's, it's very clean, very pure water. It comes from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Notice it's two persons, one throne. That's Trinitarian language. Uh, this, this water, this water of life, this crystal clear, pure, clean water, it, it flows from the, land, from the throne of the triune God. The triune God is the source of this water. This is the same water mentioned in chapter 21, verse 6, when God said, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. This is the same water. This is what he's talking about here. And uh, what is the water of life? Well, it's a, the water of life is a picture of God's perfect, abundant provision for his people, beginning with salvation from sin and reconciliation to him through the work of Jesus Christ and continuing into eternity. This it continues into eternity with, with a constant refreshment, constant renewal, constant peace, constant satisfaction. And this water of life, John says, flows from the throne of God like a river. It flows from the throne of God like a river. Now, the Greek word translated there as river, it doesn't speak of like a stream or, or, or just... We lived in Granbury before we moved here. We lived... Uh, 
the Brazos River made a loop around the area where we lived, and we could walk down the river and go fishing. And uh, I tell you, there are places, you, you could walk across the river and barely get knee deep. I mean, it wasn't much of a river to speak of, really, at that point. That's not what we're talking about here. All right, the Greek word translated here as river speaks of a flooding river, a torrent, a raging river. And so there's an abundance here. It's an abundance. So we're talking about being flooded with this peace, flooded with this sense of joy and fulfillment that flows from the throne of God. Now, throughout the Old Testament, rivers are used to, to express this, this very thing that, that, we're, that John is seeing here in chapter 21 of Revelation. Uh, rivers are used as metaphors to express the richness of God's provision, particularly as provision of peace and satisfaction. And a particularly beautiful example of this is in Psalm 46, verses 4 and 5. It says this, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. And then you have Isaiah chapter 66, verse 12, where the Lord says this, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream like an overflowing stream. And there again ties back to this Greek word translated as river. It's an overflowing abundance. And it's the river of life that John sees. It's a river of life. Greek word that John uses there that's translated as life. We've talked about this word. Uh, it's, it's very common in the New Testament. It's not talking about life as a biological fact, the idea of something simply being alive. He's talking about quality of life here. And uh, the quality of life uh, is, is represented pretty well in this metaphor of a river uh, pointing to the idea of peace and fulfillment. It's a different quality of life in this new Jerusalem. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus tells us, uh, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. By contrast, he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Same Greek word translated there as life in John 10, 10. Same word, speaks of quality of life. I came that they may have this abundant quality of life. The abundance of this river flowing from the throne of God, it's available in the New Jerusalem. But Jesus says in John 10, 10, I came that they may have it today also. It can be a present reality. This abundant life, this peace, this satisfaction. Abundant life, he says. Some translations say life to the full. Man, we catch a little taste of it in the here. Ultimately, it's a life free of stress, a life free of anxiety, a life free of worry and fear, a life free of depression, free of threats, free of danger, a life free of heartache, a life free of brokenness, a life filled with peace, a life filled with comfort, a life filled with rest, refreshment, joy, contentment, a life characterized by complete security. It's not just a thing that awaits us in eternity. It's a thing that Christ died to give us even today. We don't experience it perfectly. Not in this broken, fallen world and our broken, sinful condition, but we can experience it. It's the thing David had in mind in Psalm 23 when he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the life Christ purchased for us in his death and resurrection. And while we will experience it fully in the New Jerusalem, without anything getting in the way of it, we can experience it in some measure even now. Just as David did. Just as so many others who you know do. Furthermore, John says on either side of the river was the tree of life. So a river of life, now a tree of life. On either side of the river was the tree of life. You know, you read that and you, you think, 
okay, one tree, one river, but the trees on both, how does this work? How does one tree sit on both sides of the river? Well, the text, the way it's worded, doesn't lock us into the idea that it's just one tree. And it could be that what John is talking about here is the type of tree more so than the number. And that seems to make sense. I mean, you know, you can have the same type of tree. You can have the tree of life all over the place. You can have several of them. And, uh, you know, this scene that he talks about here is very similar to what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 47. Now, of course, Ezekiel, he had this vision in, 40, in Ezekiel 47, and it's a, it's a vision of the millennial kingdom, all right? It's a, a, a picture of, of what goes on during the thousand-year reign of Jesus. Now, in chapter 47, verse 12, he writes this, By the river on its bank, on one side and on the other, will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. They will bear each, each, every month because their water flows from the sanctuary, and their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. So you look at that verse from Ezekiel chapter 47 describing the millennial kingdom, and you look at what John describes here in Revelation chapter 22, they're very similar. I mean, the, you got water flowing, and it comes from the sanctuary, it comes from the throne of God, the source is God in each situation. Trees lining the banks of the river for food. Well, they're just various trees bearing their fruit year-round in Ezekiel, but it's the tree of life bearing its fruit year-round in John's vision. And that's the major difference between the two. of life will be present in the eternal state. In his letter to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, Jesus promised that the one who overcomes will eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Of course, the paradise of God he's talking about is this new Jerusalem. The tree of life in the new Jerusalem. The tree of life first appears in the Bible in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. Access to the tree of life is the thing that made death an impossibility for Adam and Eve there in the garden. And whenever they sinned, whenever they disobeyed God in Genesis chapter 3, and he banned them from the garden, that cut them off from the tree of life. And being cut off from the tree of life is the thing that made death not only possible, but inevitable. Now, I wanna, we're going to talk about this tree. I want you to understand this tree, all right? Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not just a, well, it's just something popping up out of the ground, and, you know, it, it's, there's something more to this. Now, in Revelation chapter 22, again, we find this tree present in the paradise of God. And what that tells us is that, that death is no longer a possibility. Death is no longer a possibility. And so the tree itself, I mean, are there really trees? Or, I don't know. Maybe there are. Maybe it's just symbolic. Whatever the case, the point is clear. And the point is this, is that once and for all, full restoration of man to the life-giving and presence of God has been accomplished. It's a done deal. Man will forever be reconciled to God, never be separated from again. Access was cut off in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, but through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's totally restored. And that, re that restoration finds its full realization in the New Jerusalem. And so it is that this tree of life, the presence of the tree of life tells us that more than anything else, Jesus Christ is present. Life flows from God, not from trees and water. These, these things are pointing back to God. That's, who, that's where these things come from. And so where the tree of life bears fruit always and provides us leaves for the healing of the nations, so in Christ we find life, eternal life. And that, well, those words, eternal life, again, we're talking about not just duration, we're talking about quality as well. Continual sustenance, full healing from this, for the nations, from the curse of sin and all its consequences, all its aftermath, including death. In Christ, we find it possible to live out our created purpose of being in perfect fellowship with him. And so it is it's, 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 that everything that's lost in the fall is recovered in Jesus Christ. I mean, the, the Bible ends where it picked up. The New Jerusalem, it, this is the place that Jesus referred to as the paradise of God. It's the New Eden. 
It's Eden 2.0. It's everything that Eden was and more. And so not only do we regain everything that was lost in the fall, we, we get a lot more. No longer be any curse, John says in verse 3. No longer be any curse. I mean, all these references back to the garden, everything taking us back to the garden. There's a restoration taking place here. Everything's coming full circle. No longer any curse. The curse is a reference to the, ju- the judgments that God rendered uh, on Adam and Eve uh, for the rebellion against him. And there's a lot of things involved in the curse. You can look at Revelation, or Genesis 3, rather, and, and see that. Uh, the most serious thing, however, was the ousting of the two from the garden. Again, the ousting of them from the gardens. Uh, uh, no longer have access to God, the tree of life. It's cut off from God. Death is now an inevitability, right? But in the New Jerusalem, no longer any curse. Access to the tree of life restored. Access to the presence of God restored. And John says in verse 4, they will see his face. They will see his face. Boy, I tell you what, when I read that, it, it takes me right straight back to Exodus chapter 33. Boy, Moses wanted to see God's glory, didn't he? And God hid him in a cleft and passed by him and says, you can't look upon me from the front. You just have to you know, catch a, the afterglow as I pass by. Right? That's all you can handle. And then in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, God says to Moses, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. No man can see me and live. That's a consequence of sin. But in New Jerusalem, we will see his face. And we will serve him, John says. Greek word translated there is serve. Uh, it, it's... Uh, the Greek word, we get our English word liturgy from this word. And you know what a liturgy is? It's like an order of service. The things that happen in a worship service, you know, a prayer, a song, or a scripture reading, sermon, you know, a liturgy, uh, this, this listing of things. Well, you know, we've kind of stripped the word of its real meaning and, and kind of that, that's just what it does, or that's, that's what we understand it to be. But the, but the word John uses here, it, it has to do with carrying out duties as an act of worship. Carrying out assigned duties is an act of worship. Now, we would typically refer to them as religious duties, but I don't know if religious duties is really a good way to describe it. It's just things that you do, and you do them as an act of worship. This is work, all right? Uh, We will serve him. We're going to ask something to do when we get there, right? Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about heaven, and you know, the, the idea of eternal worship is not an appealing thing to a lot of people. The idea of sitting in, in long wooden pews, and, and hopefully they're all back, it's nothing but one back row, right? Long wooden pew and endless dry sermons. Well, maybe not as dry as what you hear around here, maybe. I don't know. But that's the idea. And the idea is, well, if I, if I die, well, you know, when I die, if I have to go someplace, I would rather go to heaven than the other place. And, you, know, this, you know, like an upgrade or something, a little bit better. But, <laughs> and so it is, I think, when we, we, we think similarly about serving God in heaven. <sighs> Nine to five, punching a clock in heaven. Is this really what's going to go? This is not a good sermon. This isn't going the way I'd hope. We're talking about heaven and you're talking about work. Look, there will be things for us to do there. We're going to have roles. And this is part of the worship. This is part of the worship. Ongoing, continual worship expressed through everything that we do. Jobs, tasks, things to do, and they won't be things that we would rather not do. They'll be things that we're eager to do, things that God has specifically designed us to do, things that we will find complete fulfillment in. We will do these things joyfully, enthusiastically, eagerly. We'll do them as expressions of our worship and adoration to Jesus Christ. And as we serve Him, it'll draw us nearer. We'll see his face, and his name will be on our foreheads, John says in verse 4. You see that thing about names being on people, you know, he writes his name on, you know, it, it, it talks, of, that's, that, a lot, that has a lot to do with ownership, right? The kids go back to school, you buy the supplies, and you, you, put, the, you put their name on everything. I remember when I was a kid, you used to have the cigar boxes you'd buy at Target or whatever, and you, you got to write your name on it. And then we get the big fat crayons, you got to write your name on every crayon. Had the thing of paste, got to write your, everything, your name on it. 
Someone else finds it, they know who it belongs to. Ownership. We write, things, we write our names on things that belong to us so people know who this belongs to. This is mine, this is yours, this is his, this is hers. Well, God does similar things. He writes his name on his people because they are his people. But there's more to this than ownership. Because the idea of the name of God conveys something to us. It, well, his name stands for his character, right? His name stands for his character. And that his name is on our forehead is, is probably some indication that our character will once and for all be in line with his. He's identifying himself with us so fully because we, we we're, we're so totally identified with him now. We, we were cre- look, we were created to bear his image. We've talked about this a lot. We, we, we were created to bear the image of God. And in Genesis chapter th- th- 3, it, it, the wheels came off and everything's corrupted. Sin has become a, our condition. Now, the image of God is still there. We still bear the image of God. And I, it drives me nuts to hear people say, oh, well, we don't bear the image of God anymore. That was lost in the fall. No, we do still bear the image of, image of God. Ask James. He talks about it. He says, how is it you praise God with the same mouth that you curse people with? You praise God with your mouth and you curse people, what? Who were created in his own image. We still bear the image of God. We just do it in a very corrupt and warped way. In the New Jerusalem, we're going to bear it perfectly. We're going to bear it the way he always intended for us to bear it. We will once and for all be everything God desires us to be. We will once and for all be everything that he had in mind, that he had in mind for us when he created us. This is what John was talking about in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, when he wrote, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. We will see him just as he is. We will be like Jesus. I mean, John's talking there in 1 John 3, 2 about the very same thing we're talking about here. In Revelation chapter 22. Be like Jesus, totally free of sin. Can you imagine that? No, we can't imagine it because we've never experienced a moment of our life without it. It's always been there. Imagine, try to imagine it. Try to grasp this. Totally free of sin. No more desire for sin. No longer will temptation ever hold sway over us. Be no more temptation. Be righteous. Be truly righteous in our being. Right now, we're what theologians call positionally righteous. In other words, we're righteous in our standing with God. Scripture says we wear the righteousness of Christ like a garment, right? Covering up our wickedness. You know, when God looks at you, what he sees is your son, that idea. Positional righteousness. Because of what Christ has done, he's given us right standing with God. We're still sinners, we know it. But what John sees here is a time whenever we're not just positionally righteous, but we actually are righteous. We will be like him. We will be like him in his perfect character, his perfect sinless character. I think of Psalm 17, verse 15, where David said to the Lord, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. He's talking about his own righteousness, no longer just positionally righteous, righteous in my standing, but actually being righteous. What more thrilling thing can you imagine than standing in the presence of God, bearing perfect righteousness? Right now, sometimes you this, these exercises of confession and repentance, do you ever find yourself a little ashamed of the presence of God? Oh, you'll never experience that again, not in the New Jerusalem. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. And your likeness restored. Your likeness in me restored. I am whole again. To bear the image of God is to be human. To be human is to bear the image of God. And so when we talk about sin, we talk about wickedness, those are dehumanizing things. Imagine finding yourself after death in the presence of the Lord just satisfied with once and for all 
free of sin, once and for all, free of sin in his presence. No more shame, nothing to hide. As children of God, we should long for that. We should long for that purity. Just as David did. And that's why John goes on in 1 John 3, verse 3, saying everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. In other words, he he pursues purity in the here and now. You're looking forward to seeing Jesus. The evidence of that is found in your pursuit of personal purity. We don't wait for heaven for this. We seek it today. We start right now. And so Job goes on in Revelation 22, verse 5, and he says, There will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, because the Lord will, God will illumine them. People ask, well, does this literally mean that it's never going to get dark in heaven? I don't know if it literally means that or not. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Something you got to understand about John is he likes to put light and darkness next to each other. He likes for that contrast to be, you know, he likes for us to see this contrast. He, uh, throughout his gospel and in 1 John and many times here in the book of Revelation, we've seen it. He puts light and he puts darkness kind of next to each other or, or in contrast to one another in some way. Of course, light representing holiness, purity, and darkness representing all that is sin, all that is wicked. Great example of it is in his gospel account in John chapter 3. Nicodemus comes to see Jesus under the cover of night. This Pharisee, this religious leader, this holy man coming to see Jesus under the cover of night. I had a New Testament professor who called him Nick at night. Some of you get it. (laughs) And then you go into John chapter 4, what's going on there? Jesus sitting by a well at high noon, and who comes to see him but a lowly Samaritan woman who's living with a man who currently is not her husband, although she has had several. The contrast of light and darkness is something John loves to present us with. So whether or not there's not going to be any nighttime in heaven really isn't the point. Maybe there will, maybe there won't, won't rather. The point is that everything will finally be just as God has desired it to be always. Everything will finally be in perfect harmony with his character. Everything will finally be a perfect representation of his holiness. Everything will perfectly reflect its glory the way he always intended it to. And this is, again, this is hard for us to understand because we've never experienced life the way it's described in these verses. We don't have a point of reference to draw from. There's not an experience that we've had that's anything similar that we can think, well, maybe it's kind of like this, or maybe it's kind of like that. No, because it ain't kind of like anything. It's like nothing we've ever experienced. I mean, life here and now can be good, right? Right? (laughs) Amen, thank you. It It can be good. It can be good, but that goodness is often a fleeting thing, isn't it? I mean, the light comes, but then we know that the darkness is there and it's going to chase it away at some point. I mean, it's just the light and the darkness, the brokenness of sin in our own lives and and the world that just kind of messes things up and keeps things all kind of messed up. As good as it can be, it's, it's just that. It's good. And then it's gone. We have our ups, we have our downs. We have our highs, we have our lows. And sometimes there are more lows than there are highs. Sometimes there's more highs than there are lows. Sometimes the brightness of the light is, 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 it chases away the darkness, but sometimes, ironically enough, it seems like the dark of the darkness can chase away the brightness of the light. And it's not supposed to work that way, but that's what happens. I mean, we, 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 a, a month and a half ago, we were getting back to life as normal, we thought at least, right? And then COVID spikes again, this time with a vengeance. COVID spikes, what else spikes? Fear spikes, worry spikes. Peace and joy dry up. This life's a mixed bag. We ask ourselves, when will this end? Will it ever end? 
Then there's all the racial tension. Then there's all the political stuff. All the fighting over getting vaccinated, not getting vaccinated, wearing a mask, not wearing a mask. Everything going on in Afghanistan, the debacle over there. What does this mean for the rest of the world, we ask? When will this hit home? And you wonder, is it even possible to experience the abundant life Jesus promised back there in John 10, 10? Is this even possible? Well, this is why Revelation, I believe, ends the way that it does. Really, the New Testament ends the way it does. The Bible ends the way that it does. It ends with anticipation. It ends with hope. It ends with an expectancy of something better, something greater, something full, something complete, something uncorruptible. Something that cannot be teared, torn down or destroyed. Something that will never disappoint. This hope, this anticipation, this expectation that Christ will come back and he will make everything right. Everything will finally be the way it was always intended to be. And how ought this anticipation, this hope, this expectation impact the way that we live our lives today? What, how should this, what does this mean to us right here, right now? Well, again, 1 John 3, 3, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. We have our hope fixed on him. The evidence of our hope being fixed on him is that we pursue purity. We pursue his likeness. We want to be like him. And we want to start being like him right now, right, right now, right here today. Not, we don't want to wait until the end of the millennial reign and, or whatever and, and, and Revelation 22 to come to fulfillment before we're finally like him. We want it now. Shouldn't we want it now? Shouldn't this be our desire? Shouldn't this be the hunger of our heart? It's people who love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. I mean, what would you expect of a person longing to see Jesus? Surely you would expect that they would want to live a life of purity and that they would take this very seriously. Because one day he's coming back, and whenever he comes back, what is it you want him to find you doing? Well, you ought to be going ahead and doing that thing, whatever it is. And not, 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 not be doing those other things. They say that actions speak louder than words, and there's no place where this is truer than in the life of a believer. Look, I can say all kinds of things. I can make all sorts of professions, all sorts of confessions, but whether or not I'm truly pursuing holiness as a way of life, that's going to be the thing that speaks the loudest. Am I pursuing Jesus Christ not just with my words, but with my actions, my attitudes, my thoughts, my interactions with other people? We expect to see holiness in the life of a person who's earnestly looking forward to the return of Christ. But you know what? If you think about it, you know, you look at the church, just the landscape in America, the religious landscape, the Christian landscape, probably a better term in this country. Uh, the church is, 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 seems very, very largely earthbound. Very, very focused on the things here, the things we argue about and fuss over, the things that we give all our attention to. They don't amount to a hill of beans in the grand scheme of eternity. We have lost our focus. The things that we look at, the things we give attention to, the things we worry about, the things that consume us, the things we make it all about, just doesn't make sense. I'll tell you what, if your focus isn't on Jesus Christ, you're not going to be pursuing purity. You're going to be pursuing a lot of other things. Purity isn't one of them. Church wants everything. It wants all the blessing of God. wants it all right now. God bless our nation. God heal our nation. God bless our church. Just do it. Just do it. Never taking into consideration the fact that the, the, God's blessing comes as his response to our faithfulness and obedience. You know, that's a very basic principle of Scripture. 
blessing from God is the result of obedience. I mean, this is what Jesus said. Chapter 11, verse 28 of the Gospel of Luke. Don't believe me? Listen to what Jesus said. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Hear it and do it. Pay attention to it, keep it. Obedience brings blessing. Obedience is the means by which we realize the blessing of the Lord's promise of abundant life in the here and now. Obedience. And not obedience for the sake of obedience, not obedience for the sake of blessing even, but obedience for the sake of our love of Jesus Christ. Look, if the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that's the greatest commandment. If you're, if you're doing everything else but you're not doing it out of, out, of, uh, out of your love for him, well, then is everything else you're doing even a fulfillment of anything? I mean, honestly, if the motivation isn't love for God, it's not righteousness. It's not real obedience. It's falling short of the great standard of loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so what's the secret to experiencing some glimpse of the joy and the peace of heaven today? What brings heaven down now? Obedience to Christ out of love for him and the pursuit of purity. Now look, this isn't something that's just a magical formula that causes all the problems of life to go away. Because there's another promise of Scripture. This world will give you trouble. <laughs> and that is a promise I believe we can all say has been pretty well kept. This world will give you trouble. It's not going to cause you to have a pain-free experience in this life. But I'll tell you what, it will make this life a much less anxious, a much less worrisome, a much less depressive experience than it could be. Make it a much more joyful, a much more plentiful, a much more abundant and rewarding and fulfilling thing. It's all about Christ. It is all, always, all about Christ. And if it ain't all, always, all about Christ, then whatever it is, it doesn't mean anything. Whatever it is, it's pointless. If it ain't for Christ. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning as we wrap things up. Time for decisions. Of course, the altar's always open. You're welcome to come up here and pray if you like. You can do that without worrying about anybody bugging you or anything like that. If you've got a decision to make, I'm here to talk to you, to pray with you, uh, whatever you need. If you're not comfortable doing that or if you need more time, then just pull me aside or call me. Come by the office anytime. We'll talk. But certainly, we've got next steps or something we've got to do in response to the things we've heard today. What is the thing you ought to do? Well, you know where you are with Christ. And if you're not real sure, then you can understand that the Holy Spirit is prepared for you to understand. Because if there's anything God wants you to understand, He wants you to understand what He wants from you today. He wants you to understand today how things between you and Him can be a little better than they were yesterday or when you got here. He is eager, eager, eager for you to know that. If you call out to him earnestly, he'll show you. If you're one who's never trusted Christ as your Savior, and you, maybe you're wondering, wow, do I really need this? I mean, I I'm, I'm really am a pretty good person. I try to be a good person. Look, you've got to understand, this ain't about being good. This is not about being good. It's not a behavioral correction program, okay? Christianity is not about behavior correction. It is about renewal of mind that brings transformation. This is about becoming like Jesus Christ. It's about having the image of God in, in us restored to everything that we see in Jesus. He is the perfect embodiment of what a human being is to, is to be. He's the measure. He's the standard. This is about God restoring you to that standard through Jesus Christ. It's what you were created for. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, come talk to me about that. I want to help you to understand what all this means. This is serious business. Most important decision you'll ever make. In the meantime, let me pray for you. And Father, we are thankful to you for this time together in your presence. We're so thankful to you for this book of Revelation. Some things in there just seem incomprehensible. Some things just too lofty. 
too high, too far away. We can't seem to lay hold of them. Lord, in your word, you strive to bring these things down to us, to help us to understand them, to inspire us, to stir our hearts that we might draw nearer, that we might strive to reach just a little bit further, and with your help we can. So Lord, that's what we call out to you for this morning is your help. Help us, Lord. Help us to reach out a little further. Help us to reach a little further. Take a fresh step with you. Into this direction of Christ-likeness. Lord, help us. Help us to understand what that really means in our own lives. is it you're looking for us from from us today? A little stronger faith. A little more sincere effort. Lord, whatever it is, we pray that you'd help us to understand it. And then, Lord, stir in us the courage to pursue it. We ask this in Jesus' name. guys and uh, thank you Amy again for blessing us. Uh, she might have taken off. She was here. She didn't want to have to sit through this twice I bet. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so we wrap up. Uh, just I got one final thing I just want to sum up for you as, as uh, we've looked at this Revelation 21 and, and 22 into the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Look, understand this. The prize is not heaven. The prize is Jesus Christ. If you're settling for heaven, you're aiming for heaven, you're aiming just a little too low, you've got to aim for Jesus Christ. That is your focus. This is not about going to heaven. This is about being like him and being with him for eternity. I think that's just probably the best way I can sum it all up. In the meantime, uh, let's go ahead and we'll close with a word of prayer. If you would, bow your heads and uh, let me bless you one more time before we depart. Father, it's been such a joy to study this wonderful book. We do have another week left in it, but wow, particularly looking at the these glimpses of heaven that the Apostle John saw, we can almost touch it. And how we look forward to that day when once and for all we will. Paul in his letter to the Philippians, he said, I long to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. He did everything humanly possible he could to emphasize the greatness of being with Christ. And words just fall short. So, Lord, we pray that as we continue in this world, that you would use us, that you would help us, that we would submit our minds to renewal, that we might experience transformation, and pray that we might be able, with your help, to look a little bit more like the Christ who saved us to this world that's perishing. We ask this all in his name. Amen. Uh, if you lost a set of keys, you're not going far. <laughs> I have them, <laughs> so come talk to me. <laughs>